terrorists and terrorism have no border and they profess no religion. Beneath our skin, we all bleed the same blood. We forget about all our differences, we forget all about all our problems, and we just come together as a nation. Saturday, the 21st of September, 2013. A bright and sunny day, most Kenyans are engaged in their daily routine. Huh? The scenario is no different at the Westgate shopping mall. An upmarket shopping center, Westgate is bustling with eager shoppers. Being a cosmopolitan city, the mall is frequented by people of many nationalities. However, <laughs> at around 11.30 a.m., the tranquility of Westgate is shattered by the sound of gunfire. Four men storm into the mall, brazenly shooting all inside. Hello? Yeah, they are armed. I can see two. And to confirm people's worst fears, The search continues for gunmen who opened Kenyan fire. Kenyan capital, Nairobi. The death toll currently stands at 68. <laughs> On the top floor of the mall, young contestants are taking part in a cooking competition. Among them is Raisa Virani. Her courage and determination to leave will be severely tested on this day. You know, as they say that when you're in such a situation, like, you should just be positive and think about all the good things that, you know, can happen in that moment. Um, survival, getting out of their escape, you know, and um, it was just prayers, I was just praying, happy thoughts. And as I said, in a, I wanted to come out of this a victor, not a victim. For her troubles, the 15-year-old is shot in two places. Her friend has also been hit. My wounds were in the upper body and I could feel the stress and the tension, but I was able to walk. Um, that was um, an advantage for me. Uh, so I wasn't struggling to move when they said we could move. I just helped my friend put her in a trolley. You know, you gain this strength somehow. Uh, you don't even realize where it's coming from. You put her in a trolley, and I pushed her to Java. And then from there, there were these paramedics guys, and they were, you know, um, hiding. They were protecting themselves as well, but they were helping us to get out and get through the Java kitchen. So I left her there, because now there were stairs to go down. And I didn't know how I would help her, because now I realize that there's blood all over me. I have to help get help myself. It could have been easy for Kenyans to be despondent. Under siege and at the mercy of combatants in their own country. Instead, they rose as one.
you see it in moments when there's a whole sense of patriotism and togetherness because when you see moments when Kenyans all come together and just behave as one, there's a group think which is positive because then we forget about all our differences, we forget all about all our problems and we just come together as a nation. The Kenyan spirit is a spirit that perseveres through all sorts of situations. It's also a spirit that aspires to do better despite all of the things that we say about ourselves and how we can, we can really browbeat ourselves. We all aspire for a very higher goal. The Kenyan spirit is one of in, in immense creativity. At the end of the four-day siege, 72 people will be dead and 175 injured. Al-Shabaab, a jihadist group affiliated to Al-Qaeda, claims responsibility. Terrorists and terrorism have no border and they profess no religion. These are sadists, these are people who enjoy killing, whether it is a young life or a middle life or an old life. The terrorist group didn't care about people like Janet Mwikali and the families that lost their loved ones. Janet's husband of 24 years was one of the 72 who lost their lives that day. We were half demaliate and I live to remember him. I don't know what to do, how to educate the kids. But God is there for me, and he is there for us. So I hope God will open another way for us so that we may survive with my family. Among the first respondents of that fateful day was the Kenya Red Cross. Created in 1965 through an act of parliament, the relief organization has always responded to Kenyans in their hour of need. On August 7, 1998, the American embassy in Nairobi was attacked by Al-Qaeda. More than 224 people lost their lives Thousands more were injured in their souls. Four years later, Al-Qaeda targets the Paradise Hotel in the coastal city of Mombasa, killing 13 and injuring 80. Living up to their reputation, the humanitarian organization was the first on the scene on both occasions. Okay, now. During the Westgate attack, Dr. James Kissier put his life on the line as he struggled to save lives. It is the human spirit, really. I mean, you. You have seen that during the bomb blast, uh, the American embassy bomb blast. We saw that, that Kenyans were helping in whichever way that they could. Kisia, who has worked with the organization for the last eight years, reflects on what made the rescue operations a success. There's not one organization that can do everything. There's not one individual that can do everything you need. Uh, all the ambulance services, all the hospitals, 
You need coordination between hospitals and people who are in the ambulance. So teamwork is extremely important. It can make work a lot easier if you're working together as a team. While the Kenya Red Cross may have earned its reputation as a first aid provider by saving lives and easing pain in the opening hours of the crisis, their service did not end there. In late March of 2014, they pulled out a bulletin looking for all who lost their relatives in the massacre. They also distributed 40 million shillings, or approximately 500,000 US dollars, collected from a fundraiser. At the same time, they started the second phase of psychosocial support for 10,000 of those traumatized by the event. A lot of people who I think were the embodiment of the Kenyan spirit at that particular moment, when they were needed, they didn't care about competitors, they didn't care about profits, they gave up what they could. And it's amazing and I'm sure the whole country is grateful to them. The Red Cross is made up of people but their personnel alone were not going to help the injured and the scarred. They needed more volunteers, money, supplies, security, and blood. That would come from a number of different directions. It's, I think it's amazing. In fact, uh, you could think some of the people who are treating and passing the information are doctors themselves, but uh, they are just a common person sitting at home or being at the scene trying to raise the issue for Kenyans uh, to know. For you to do whatever development you want. Penny Musengi, a social entrepreneur, uses her skills to mobilize and organize resources for the relief efforts. Yes. Last month we didn't have any problem. This yes. is uh, nationwide, almost a worldwide calamity, you know, so that togetherness is something that they felt. So when I was calling someone at 1 a.m. and 3 a.m., they were easily picking their phone calls. There were some who were even calling me back at 5, who were shopping at 7 in the morning, who were already at Kencom by 6 in the morning. So I, I didn't get that this time around. I just got everyone willing to support and to come out as a Kenyan. Through her endeavors, more than 500 volunteers served in places and capacities where they were critically needed. Although the 30-year-old has been in and out of hospital for the last two years due to injuries sustained in a car accident, she summoned that extra energy in order to be part of the relief effort. I, I saw that I was called to do something and that something was to mobilize all my friends and networks that I had and companies. And we went on ground to give the additional support. This is supplies from food staff to the security, to the tents, to logistics. Um, and I still believe that there's so much more that can be done. Penny Musangi embodies what most Kenyans felt during that trying period. Although helpless, they never allow themselves to be hopeless. Just as a disaster is unraveling, Zioka Waita and many other thousands are cheering at the Kenya Sevens rugby team in the annual Safari Sevens. Hillary, that's a very critical try. As news filters through, he and his team at Safaricom are spurred on to action. My team and I thought we need to give people a channel to send their, um, something that they're familiar with to send their assistance, uh, financial assistance. 
They then contacted the Kenya Red Cross, who readily accepted the support. Within a matter of minutes, we had set up the 848484 uh, pay bill number. We had it zero rated immediately. Uh, the M-Pesa uh, contributions, uh, the ones that were done over the Airtel the mobile phone network, I think over you as well, those things help, help significantly with the, with the Kenyan Red Cross um, in trying to be able to mobilize the kind of resources that people would need to get treated. But over and above that, I, I think there are some hospitals that wrote off the, the bills of people even without those contributions. So you can see that in terms of the, the, the willingness to help, everybody from corporates to the individual who just had 10 bob on their M-Pesa that day were willing to help. In the first four days after the plea was initiated, approximately 70 million shillings or about 850,000 US dollars was raised through M-Pesa alone. Over 150 million shillings or about 1.7 million dollars has been raised to date. You do see a lot more uh, togetherness when we stand up um, to either defend the national integrity or to stand up to assist our brothers and sisters who may be in need. What is perhaps most impressive is that this money didn't come from the rich. But a lot of people came out to give over 100 million shillings through money transfer services and they didn't give a lot of money. They gave $50 and $30 and small amounts of money in Kenya shillings. But combined, it added up to a lot of money people, for people that never met, for places they've never been. And a lot of Kenyans have never been to Westgate. It's in Nairobi. It's in an affluent part of Nairobi. But they still gave anyway, not out of excess, but because of necessity. While quite a huge number were able to give money in Nairobi and from around the country, there was a more immediate, more personal need. Blood. I think one of the most incredible things about the whole Wastegate situation was how many people just came out to donate blood. People who had never donated blood ever, they did not anticipate how much reaction there would be because they didn't even have enough blood bags. And for a whole week, people were just coming out and not just in Nairobi, who had first-hand experience with Westgate, but all over the country. They hit records they'd never hit for years just because of one tragedy. Immediately after the appeal was launched, thousands thronged blood donation centers. So much so that the Kenya Red Cross had to turn away eager Kenyans as blood donation bags ran out at the temporary collection points in Nairobi. We were able to get more people than we got. In two or three days, we were able to get to collect blood that is collected in this country in more than a month. So I think, for me, I choose to dwell on the, on the positive. And the good thing is that there were lessons that were learned the lessons are that Kenyans are willing to give blood uh, to help their brothers and sisters. At the end of that week, around 17,300 units were collected. Josephine Ndiho, a trained paramedic, was among the multitudes who queued up to give of themselves. She was amazed by the turnout of the young. They were willing, more than willing to help because that was the only way they could show help at the time. Because everything on that particular area was settled by the police, it was guarded, it was very dangerous for any Kenyan to get close to rescue. It wasn't like a fire. This was something that the nation had to come together to to show unity and that was just brought together by donating blood. While Kenyans came together to give of themselves, from their own bodies to their material possessions, they also came together to share grief. From playing each other inspiring songs on the radio, 
to going to see friends with personal condolences, the community came together. Sami Wambogo has been helping hundreds of people cope with what they went through from the opening hours of the tragedy. When people, you know, are exposed to such traumatic events and they do not get immediate help, all those connections, all those support, they end up, um, you know, growing or, or becoming, you know, more affected in the course of their lives. So what we did in the, in the, on the ground is that we were addressing that situation. Sami met many of the brave who escaped, the traumatized, and those whose loved ones didn't. He also found that Westgate helped bring out many others with psychological needs. Westgate was just an opening. Westgate was just a place where we can name it in a name. But the people who are coming to our centers are the 1998 bomb blast. They are the post-election violence. They are the domestic violence we have in the country. Those are the people who are walking into the center seeking for help, who are already really traumatized. Grieving together seemed to have a healing effect which led to a quick recovery. Strangers in the morning. At the end of the siege, they will be united in grief. There are so many people whom I met when we were searching for our, for our relatives. Like I found a mother, she was called Charity. She had lost her husband. We were struggling together for all that time. Then when I got my husband over the city mortuary, she also found her husband at the city mortuary next to my husband. We have been sharing since that time. We have been talking, sharing about our lives, how she's faring on and how I'm faring on. I think when you're dealing with grief, uh, it's just for some times. That is my observation. We can, like during the West Gate, we can, you know, for the first, uh, first, I think it ended for four days, the siege ended after four days. Everybody was on the same to topic, everywhere, on radio, on TV, on social media, everybody was discussing the same thing. However, like anybody else who's going through a hard moment, everybody has moments of anguish and pain and just complete confusion. You don't know what happened and why it happened to you. But that said, after your whole moments of just losing yourself in the grief of the moment and allowing yourself to feel sad and to cry if need be, there is some kind of appreciation that despite everything, you're still grateful to be alive, you're still grateful that you might have lost family, but you're, you're thankful for the life they had. And they, I see a lot of even funerals in Kenya now turning into celebrations. For many visitors, the resilience of Kenyans was remarkable. Just a week after the tragedy, other shopping malls were busy. People started to talk about other things on the radio. Why are Kenyans able to bounce back quickly? So many things like um, comedy, for example, makes us move on more easy. Like um, we overlook so many tragic things by using the comedy side of it. Um, it wasn't an easy thing at first, but um, making comedy slide in with the tragedy makes it 
easy to move on for Kenyans. Kenyans have that sense for it could have been any of us in whatever tragedy it was and we escaped. So we have, we're grateful to be here, but also we need to move on and we're not going to stop our lives. It's the culture of accept and move on. Okay, you see it has happened. What are we going to do? Nothing. So let's move on. In everything, the culture is accept and move on. And we should stop this culture of accepting and move on. Yes, we should accept, question, and put it into action. But we have this very funny culture of Westgate has happened, tomorrow something else will happen. Like now something happened in Mumbai, the other day something happened in Mombasa, you know. But people have accepted and moved on. That's the problem with, our, with us. <laughs>because we have no intention whatsoever of going backward. Now, thank you very much. Fifteen immigration officials were dismissed for issuing identification documents to illegal immigrants. Yeah. The Kenya Defense Forces had to defend themselves against accusations of looting. But journalists were still left frustrated with the lack of action and accountability from the government. But the funny thing is that after the entire thing, we don't ask questions. We don't uh, plan to avoid such things again. After, after the entire thing, everybody will forget. And when it happens again, we come together. It seems that we have this culture of uh, mourning and loving each other and after the entire thing we forget each other and everybody goes back to his business without questioning and planning to avoid such attacks in future. But Kenya remains a society of many groups who need to get along, not point fingers at each other. You know the way we say that we're tribal? It's true. We're very tribal as a country. But beneath our skin we all bleed the same blood. And I think blood and donation of, the blood, of, of blood was a perfect analogy for how we can put aside our differences and work for the common good. For many Kenyans, 2013 was supposed to be a good year. They had a new constitution in place. A new president. I, Uhuru Kenyatta. 50 years of self rule. There was no better time to be Kenyan. Then, tragedy struck. But Kenyans were not going to allow anyone to spoil their year. At the end of the day, the message to the terrorists was clear. They were one. We have overcome terrorist attacks before. In fact, we have fought courageously and defeated them within and outside our borders. We will defeat them again. Terrorism, in and of itself, is the philosophy of cowards. My government stands ready to defend the nation from internal as well as external aggression. I urge all Kenyans to stand together and see this dark moment through. But let me make it clear that we shall hunt down the perpetrators wherever they run to. We shall get them and we shall punish them for this heinous crime.